I guess I'll start with this. I'm going to write a quantity for you and ask you what you think of it. All right, you ready? So suppose I, I, I write this. Suppose we say let um, A, B, and C be 3D vectors. Okay. Let's talk about this quantity. So the first question I have is, is that quantity a scalar or a vector? Now, yeah, it's a, it's a scalar. Now, you might think for a second, all right, well, you know, how do you know that? Or maybe you just reason because the norm is there. Norm is always a scalar value. But you should look inside and just make sure that that expression makes sense, right? It does because B cross C, this thing by itself, would be a vector. And then you're dotting that with another vector, which you're allowed to do. You're allowed to do dot products between two vectors. So this thing on the inside is a vector. But then when you take the norm of the vector, or norm of a vector, you get a scalar. OK. So it turns out this actually has a, a, a pretty neat interpretation. That's what we're going to look at. And it won't take, it won't take long to derive it. OK. But uh, we'll, we'll take a look at it. OK. Now, all right, so I'm going to ask you to consider a picture here, and then, and then we'll bring meaning to, to, to that expression. So let's draw, um, here we go, draw a line this way and this way. And you could think of this as like the x, y, z axis, you know, x is coming this way, whatever you like. All right, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a vector b here. Here's vector b. I'm going to put vector a like this. This is going to be uh, right there is vector a. And then um, vector C is going back in this direction. This is vector C. So vector C, it looks like it's in between the two vectors. But it's actually going back into the page. All right? Think of it as being along um, like an x-axis. Here's the x-axis. Here's the y-axis. Here's the z-axis. And then you can kind of see, literally, that vector C is going back into the board. OK? All right. So actually, uh, a little bit of 3D drawing, we can create kind of a nice picture. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to make a copy of B over here. There's vector B again. There's vector A again. I'm making a copy of vector A. All right. And then I'm going to take vector C and sort of put it on the end of all these things. So we end up with uh, this. There's vector A again. This is vector C up here, like a copy of vector C. Here's a uh, Vector C again over here, another copy of C, and there's vector B up here, vector B on the bottom, right? Here's vector C going back, and there's vector A again, right? Here's vector C. And while that picture is not really that great, um, this parallelogram on the front face here, parallelogram spanned by vectors A and B, should have been, uh, look, should look just like the parallelogram spanned by this vector and this vector, A and, A and B again, okay? But uh, my picture is not that well drawn. You'll have to you'll have to tolerate that picture. Okay. So um, this kind of shape has a name. Sorry about that. This kind of shape is called a parallela a parallela piped. You know how our parallel piped pipe head people call it different things. I, I just call it parallel pipe parallel piped. Um, anyway, um, what I'm going to ask you to do is think about what you remember about volume of three-dimensional objects. Okay, so we learn that volume in general. There's a couple of things, but we learn the basic idea is that it's area of the base times the height. Okay. Um, now, some of you may not have seen that before. I don't know. Let me just let me just uh, this, this, a little bit of justification for this idea. Um, imagine you had a uh, a cylinder, and you could think of a cylinder as like a set of, of like a stack of quarters, maybe, right? It's a stack of circles, right? Um, the area of the circles, let's pretend that has a radius r and a height of h. The area of the base okay, is going to be pi r squared, right? 
And then if I ask you to find the volume of the cylinder, it's sort of like saying, hey, find the volume of a stack of quarters. Find the volume of a stack of circles. So what we end up doing is, we, to get the volume, we take the area of the base, and we multiply it by how high the pile is, right? Now, I'm talking about the stack of quarters analogy because if you think about it, to so pretend we had a stack of like 50 quarters, those 50 quarters could be arranged to stack up into a cylinder, and they would have a certain volume. Now, if someone came along and pushed them on the stack of quarters in such a way that it kind of tipped a little bit, here would be my new shape, right? I don't know what you'd call that, right? It's a non I think it's a non-right circular cylinder. I'm pretty sure that's what you call it, meaning that the right that the angle that the height makes with the radius is not 90 degrees. Okay. Well, uh, if you're thinking about the stack of quarters, the stack of quarters themselves would have to have the same volume. It's the same 50 quarters, right? They take up the same amount of space in the 3D world. It's just that the piles have been pushed over a little bit. So that's sort of like an intuitive justification why the, the volume of this thing should still be the same. It should still be the area of the base, which represents the area of each quarter, times how tall it is. Okay, times this height. Okay, so in general, that's the case with volumes of of, of of 3D objects. Not all of them, but some of them. Okay, so we'll just we'll just talk about that for now. We're going to use that idea here, here, because what I'm thinking is we could think of the following: instead of stacking quarters, right, we could think of stacking parallelograms that are spanned by B and C. So there, that base parallelogram, we can stack a bunch of those, right? And if we stack them up, if we stack them up at a right angle, we would get a rectangular box. But this is sort of like they've been stacked and someone pushed the pile over a little bit, just like someone pushed over my pile of quarters, right? So that's what we have. So here we go. So we're actually, we're, we're almost there. The reason I'm asking you to think about this parallelogram shaped base is because we just learned about a relationship between the norm of the cross product and the area of the parallelogram spanned by the two vectors. And I said they're equal, right? So the area of the base of this parallel pipe is the norm of B cross C. That's what it is. We proved that yesterday or in another video just like that, right? Okay, now all we need is the height. Okay, so we need the height. If we can multiply it by the height, we'd be we'd be good to go. All right, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do that next. Ready? Um, the height of this thing we can think of as the following. It would be like the length of some vector up along the z-axis, right? Well, the only vector that's headed in a vertical direction at all is vector A. It's not heading directly vertical, but it is coming up off of the xy plane. Vectors B and C lie in the xy plane, so they would not be able to give us any vertical height change. But this is the height I want. I want to know the length of that thing. All right, well, I'm just going to make a right triangle out of this. I'm going to say, all right, let's put a right triangle right here. And the nice thing is I know the hypotenuse of the right triangle has length norm A. I'm going to call this angle down here theta, right? And we're done. We can say that the, that we can say this: the cosine of theta is adjacent, which is the height, over the norm of a. Or we can say that that is um, that h equals norm a cosine theta. And now we have an expression for the height of this pile of parallelograms, right? I want you to think of it like that, this pile of parallelograms, just like the pile of quarters. So um, let's write that down. This is going to be the norm of a cross b. Uh, then you have um, this. OK. All righty. So that's, that's what you have, right? OK, but then if you look carefully at that, what do you notice about it? We recognize this as the dot product of A dot B cross C. Okay. Now, um, 
We know that's a scalar quantity, so it makes sense that could be the volume. There's only one thing we need to worry about, and that is um, B cross C. If we think about B cross C for a minute, right? Um, dot price, it's possible that that could be a vector with all negative components, right? You can go in a direction such that all its components are negative, and then maybe vector A has all positive components, so we can get back a negative dot product. So I'm just going to put absolute value around this as the one stipulation that gives us a volume, right? So I'm putting absolute value here. Now, this is sort of fun to write, because when you write this, it looks like a norm. It looks like a, a magnitude of a vector, right? But that's not, this is sort of an absolute value of a dot product, which in itself we could think of as like a magnitude of a one-dimensional vector. But uh, anyway, that's that.